Expert Inside Interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeline or CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined actually also from in San Diego today by Andy Anurban Bhattacharya. How are you doing, Andy? Good, good. How are you this afternoon? Yeah, and Andy's a sustainability expert, and he's the founder of Amplify 4.0, a company specializing in digital platforms for ESG reporting and sustainable supply chain management. He is very passionate about integrating AI, Internet of Things, and innovative partnerships to create transparent, efficient, and purpose-driven business models. And he's a thought leader in the field, frequently speaking on all things sustainable. And that's what we're going to talk about today is... How do you transform your business model for sustainability? And maybe, and maybe even before we say how you do that, why should you, Andy? First of all, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity, John. I will start with why. Uh, for everything that we do, there has to be three aspects, right? It's about running a successful, profitable business. Mm -hmm. uh, that business should make, uh, should transform and change and bring better things to the ecosystem. And I would say the third one that I will add is, uh, is there a purpose, which I call purpose led. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a culmination of all the three. So it's a why is of course, running a profitable business, um, creating an impact and it has to be purpose led. So that's the why part, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and and then uh, and so that that's that's the why part. Um, but a lot of people sometimes when they hear about initiatives like sustainability and things, they think, yeah, it's it's nice, it sounds nice, it sounds aspirational, but it sounds like it could be quite disruptive and maybe even costly. That's a that's a great perspective. So let's kind of peel the onion a little bit on that, John. So uh, if you really see the legacy of, let's pick on, let's pick on pure supply chain, pre-COVID, post-COVID. So for supply chain, uh, it has always been, um, we talked about globalization a lot. Recently, we're talking about uh, deglobalization a lot mm -hmm. at post-COVID regionalization. But one thing that is very important that when we are, when we are doing business between countries and continents, uh, it has to be very responsible. So responsible means uh, supply chain, just emitting uh, carbon being sitting on the uh, queue to get the products docked in uh, LA, um, LA port, which mm -hmm. was a big challenge, as you know. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of like, a uh, lot of, lot of carbon emission has happened during that time. So, Look, at the end of the day, uh, supply chain with with a more of a, a carbon, low carbon transition intensity program has always benefited not only from a nice to have, but also must have because each of this, each of this carbon emitting uh, programs in supply chain has really impacted um has impacted the perception of the company uh it impacted the overall buyers consumers of the company uh, most of the buyers are very consumers are very uh they are generally responsible and and at the same time what we feel on supply chain is if you're not managing the waste and the carbon and the water everything properly it's at the end it's a hit on bottom line so one of the things, John, what I have done, we have done as a, as a, as a company is really taking each of the components of burn, which is carbon bar, burn. When you buy electricity, that's a burn too. It's a buy, burn. And then your suppliers and distributors, that's beyond. That's a burn too. They're also burning, right? So burn, buy, beyond all have impacted um, the overall cost of supply chain. So cost of supply chain can be completely transposed into balance sheet, income statement, uh, and we have done it. It's mm -hmm. about moving the needle through regulation and compliance, its own awareness, mm -hmm. and really 
taking the needle from a perceptive nice to have to really must have. Right. And I think some some organizations have already figured this out. They have gone beyond regulations already to do a better execution in supply chain. At the end, it's all about execution, right? Mm -hmm. So the holisticity of this response is, John, not nice to have, but must have. It directly impacts your bottom line. It impacts your top line because some buyers are responsible buyers. You're taking away that buyer or consumer if you're not doing the greener supply chain. And then also a big piece of the puzzle around it is when you do cross-border transactions, kind of countries like Scandinavian countries and others, they are really, really making sure that uh, these are taken care of and to enter a new market, let's say a Scandinavian market or those market for a business, you have to be a responsible, have to carry a responsible supply chain. Mm -hmm. So new market entry, new funds from the Wall Street, um, any 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 uh, like supply chain, cross-border supply chain, avoid carbon taxes are becoming mandatory. So I feel that it's slowly hitting from, I would say, from nice to have to must have. Right. And it's hitting the balance sheet as well. Mm -hmm. So then uh, so then if you figure out the why and then you say, OK, this is the results of an economic imperative here. Uh, how where where do you advise companies to start? Because there's often when you approach a something, a subject like this, you know, people can get very excited about it, maybe try to boil the ocean all at once rather than take uh, approach it in a systematic fashion. So how do you advise companies to approach their their transition to being a more sustainable company? So there are um, two school of thoughts here. One school of thought is if I'm able to collect data and I report the regulations, my job ends there. So data mm -hmm. collection from various business units and reporting at the CFO desk to stay at in course at course on environmental, social, and governance attributes. That's one aspect of it. But it has a larger impact, larger aspect beyond ESG, which we call sustainability. So I want mm -hmm. to distinguish with my response what ESG is and sustainability in a broader manner, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it is when somebody wants to get started on these kinds of uh, programs, which generally sits on supply chain, sits on finance, sits on procurement, sits on manufacturing, because sustainability as a program never goes alone, right? So that's an important attribute we have to realize. So I can only focus on data collection and reporting. That's all mandated me for my regulations or I can really understand what my competition is doing, do a benchmarking, uh, really figure out the overall aspect of materiality, which is what is material, material to report and what is not material to report, figure out your gaps in the organization and really create a heat map, if, my, if I may use that term, heat map to figure out that what do you already have which we never thought would be very relevant during the world of sustainability and what you don't have and how you will really expedite your journey towards what you must have, right? So that whole analysis, gap analysis, beyond just data collection and reporting would also be an important factor. So there are two ways that you can attack this. One is you go bottoms up, just data collect and report, your job ends, then suddenly you realize that you're not holistically seeing it. That's a short-term banded but the long-term right way of approaching is top down right you basically look into the gaps what your competition is doing how do you're relooking your supply chain and value chain with your suppliers with your distributors being you being the in the middle as a company and really take a very holistic look so the holisticity look is where you're it, it you will start with benchmarking and most of the organizations, John, are now getting into an outside in view. So people are like really having rating companies and data companies are providing benchmarking data. We buy data from them too. So really figure out an initial holistic benchmarking before right. we say, hey, Mr. CRO or Ms. CRO, give me this data uh, and then I will do benchmarking. So one of the good things, John, is happening in the industry is like, the benchmarking is happening even before making the users and the organization being nervous that oh give me the data then only i can start yeah that, those days are going away right like 
more outside in first than inside in. And then you basically do data collection and then reporting. So it's benchmarking risk, data collection, and then reporting. So things yeah. are moving from bottoms up to top down slowly. It's just a leadership call that how where you want to start. So when you've um, when you've worked with companies and you've seen examples of this, uh, well, what are some of the outcomes that maybe are surprising to to companies? Maybe a little bit unexpected, you know, benefits that they didn't realize they would have. Great question. So I, I will give a give a live example, right? So we are working with a with a, with a packaging company, and uh, what we have done along with them for them as a as an organization and their customers it's the way inventory should have been optimized in the various nodes of inventory zones just before bringing climate water energy analysis and after water climate energy analysis the whole inventory disposition changed. Hmm. So the buffering of the inventory really slowed, like really being taken away. And there's a huge, huge cost saving because now based on climate, heat, um, tsunami, wherever it is, where the part of the zones of the world is, snow, um, hurricane, that whole factorization of that, and then your water consumption, your energy consumption being a heat, a, uh, like a hot city versus a colder city, how the heat gets, mm -hmm. uh, energy gets uh, sucked into. All these have like becoming a factor in your overall inventory buffering planning. And this is an eye opener for for the value chain partners for this packaging company. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a, it's a, these parameters are new because everybody is doing sales and operations, annual planning for a long, long time, right? Mm -hmm. But looking into the lens of sustainability, the examples I'm giving here, like yep. really looking to, through that lens, is a very new normal, mm -hmm. right? And then, what is it, what are some of the challenges that organizations face in 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 pushing through initiatives like this? Because they're always, you know, especially in larger organizations, say that are harder, you know, to try. It's like you turning the Titanic on a dime is obviously quite a hard thing to do. So big organizations, what are some of the challenges that maybe larger organizations face in being able to uh, yeah. you know, really implement initiatives like this? So it's, a, it's an interesting question because larger organizations have more bureaucracy, more regulation needs. Mm -hmm. So they sh should do this more faster than these mid mid-size or smaller companies. But they are more, the change management is a big struggle out there, right. right? Whereas smaller companies may or may not even need this because they think, oh, this is optional. But when they want to do business with the larger companies, they being a supplier to the larger companies, they have to go through this mandate. So they also have to do it. The good news in both cases is the smaller companies are nimble, agile. So getting into sustainability journey is easier because they're a smaller company and they have to do for the larger companies to do mm -hmm. business in the ecosystem. The larger companies are already have the, are the, are the trendsetters, right? Take Unilever as an example. They're trendsetters, right. right? So, but yes, there is a bureaucracy change management thing, but they're also trendsetting it. So the good news from both aspects, right? But yeah, large companies have change management struggle and small companies will have hey is this nice to have or we must do it they must do it because otherwise otherwise when they're going out for acquisition or growth um this will be an impediment if they right. don't do it so if you were advising somebody who is starting a business maybe or an early stage startup how would you tell them to set themselves up from the get-go to be able to okay. you know, to take advantage of this so first of all, irrespective of sustainability, uh, climate tech startup or not, I will say that uh, raise funds during ideation. That's my <laughs> first mistake that I have done. Right. I have not raised funds during ideation, uh, ideation. So that's the first thing, right? The second thing I will advise is that in these situations, um, really figuring out that you will not be able to solve the problem alone. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you solve one problem and work within a partnership model. Do not go alone and solve the world hunger, right? Mm -hmm. Have a partner-led model in your head. Third is the advice has to be everything needs to be transposed into customer 
empathy and customer impact. I know the last one is very much a cliche, but the reason I have to stress upon that, especially on sustainability, climate tech, um, carbon accounting, reporting, whatever we are working in, uh, making that value analysis done well and early, and the rest could be told in the ca cafeteria, as I call it. The right. value analysis and the impact analysis is very, very important, right? So mm -hmm. to summarize, I would say that, yeah, it's about raise funds during ideation. Do not solve the problem alone. Have a partner-led model. Absolutely make sure that it's a, the customer empathy is coming out that, look, if you do this, the 10 things you'll be doing better. Right. And then I, I guess another another consideration, and this is for an, any company, is that if you're going to do an initiative like this, it should be real rather than because, I mean, I see that, you know, we've been through a lot of times where people like to stick what I always call bumper stickers on their website to say we're this or we're that. But it really doesn't go beyond that. Yeah. Um, so so the the real authenticity of a company doing this you know for the right reasons doing it properly I mean that's something that obviously needs to be communicated throughout the organization but also visible from the outside very interesting perspective that you're bringing right here so I think if I answer, uh, understand the question is how real this the idea is to deliver value yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm saying sometimes right. people will say, okay, sustainability sounds good right now. A lot of people okay. are talking so you're, about you're, it. Now stick it's not it, enough. Yeah, stick okay. it on the website uh, yeah. or we're, we're sustainable or whatever. Okay. And it doesn't really go much further. So, so you're not only talking about sustainable, you're not talking about just entrepreneurship. Sure. It's, you're talking about entrepreneurship and sustainability. Sure. Right? So, mm -hmm. so sustainability is something I feel will be the most transformative topic and agenda for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's a slow moving uh, gig, right? Mm -hmm. And here is why. Not every company has figured this out connecting to the financial impact. Yeah. Some companies have, some companies haven't. So connecting the whole sustainability program to balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow mm -hmm. is absolutely mandatory. Otherwise, you can have the most beautiful website in the world. After a certain point of time, you will not be winning business anymore. You have to shut mm -hmm. it down, right? Because it's a nice to have, right? Yeah. The one thing what we have done from our experience is that we immediately have transposed value on the economic impact and the financial impact. Because when you do a risk analysis, so look, we are very upstream, right? We do climate risk sure. analysis. We say climate, but it's environment water, energy, everything, right? And when the analysis is done, we hand over to a carbon accounting company where we partner, okay? Same message, partnership. They will take our outcomes. They will say, oh, okay, if these many risks, KPIs I need to measure, here's my carbon strategy, right? This carbon strategy now get into your reporting and say, okay, this is a carbon thing. And then companies are already having carbon credits. They are already in the carbon market. So it's a new revenue model coming up. So if you really see this value chain I just talked about, okay, yep. it's sitting on top of your supply chain, right? This is a real, this is a real conversation that we are mm -hmm. having. So, so I feel like sustainability, the theme that you're bringing, John, in this particular uh, discussion, uh, how real real is, right? Because I've done it, right? So yeah. I know how real real is. I feel it's new on supply chain, finance, procurement, everything, it's new. Second is, it is absolutely will be here to stay back for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Third is um, this whole net zero strategy by the organization of carbon neutrality is it's really real because that's where your Paris Agreement will be is getting met or be met. And the fourth one is very important. Looking to the lens of better supply chain, where waste is almost zero, regulations are highly met, it always brings out better quality of product products, right? Forget mm -hmm. about anything else. But just bringing up that quality product, it's an immediate top line impact. So I will say this again, scope one, two, and three, and four, that's why we use the terms in our, in our language of sustainability has now they are hitting the balance sheet. 
Right. So this is real. It's not a like a sticker on the website that we do. And this is something that we need to we need to make sure that um, we need to make sure that we. Uh, I think I did. I, did I lose you? No, no, no. I'm listening. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so basically, it is. It's it's for us. It's real, right? Yeah. But you're right. I mean, if I may just touch upon a sure. little bit of pointer on the on the greenwashing, right? Um, it's very important that when we are driving these kinds of strategy and execution on sustainability, uh, it we it, we need to quickly figure out that the organization is greenwashing or not. Right. So that's very important. We are very cautious about that when we go and consult and implement solutions with our platform. So we are very cognizant about that as mm -hmm. a partner to the organization right. who are bringing us on. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's yeah. it has it is real, and we are here to make it real. Yeah. And just a last quick question. Um, how quickly do you think this is going to become like a stable, if you like, a main a mainstream, like just something that people do because it's just part of business and you can't do business otherwise? When, when do you think we'll transition to that? So I, I feel that that has already been happening. So if you really see the New York uh, Climate Week, which is coming up on September 26th, the week of September 23rd, rather, sorry, um, that's where... The climate finance team is talking about how the 401k can be implemented with climate finance solutions right so what's the return on investment on that so people are already in that realm of mm -hmm. real implementations i feel that it will take up one more year where the regulations are becoming more and more stringent It'll be one more year. I feel uh, people have started seeing the value and it should come from the top. And uh, as you know, the European government has mandated from January 2026 to do a lot of these reportings already. And uh, I think the other part of the globe will also do it. So I would say one more year. That will be my answer. Right. Excellent. Well, listen, Andy, thank you so much for this. It's been absolutely fascinating and, and very, very insightful. Um, all of Andy's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Oh, absolutely. So so first of all, for me, uh, I outside my entrepreneurial journey, uh, I'm actually an author. I have books um, in Amazon. I write both business and fiction books. I'm very... I. I have, generally when I write, I want to leave back a strong message to the readers. Um, second, I actually teach um, at, uh, I'm, I'm, I help a professor, we call it adjunct at Rutgers University in East right. Coast, though mm -hmm. I'm in San Diego right now. Uh, and uh, I also run a large, um, I wouldn't say large, but the, like I run a lot, um, I I run an anti-sex trafficking organization from New York. So we have a few hostels in uh, Nepal, India border, where we save vulnerable women. Mm -hmm. And we really coach them, train them in what we call 10 asset cards, the theory of change, where they can be empowered themselves to save more women or mm -hmm. more vulnerable women. So, so I spend time in nonprofit writing and teaching. Uh, nobody has asked me to do that, but I want to leave back a legacy. Uh, and also, I I am also a, an entrepreneur. Right. Wow. It's, I'm not even going to ask you what you do in your spare time because it doesn't sound like you have any. <laughs> so That's, listen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Listen. Thanks again, Andy. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.